these are some pictures of you know, the, the aspects of the gas business. So one of the most common services for a, for a consumer, when they think of natural gas, if I ask you, what do you use natural gas for? Most people, one of the first things that comes out of their mouth is cooking. Other people, it's heating their home, things like that. And these are just Moss Landing. So it's an energy facility in Monterey that we wish we could go to, that, uh, but that's a picture from. And then North Dakota, the pump jacks we've talked about before. This is an article that we're going to add to Slack. It just came out from McKinsey. And so I'm inserting it into the, the deck for you all right now. And I was intrigued by the idea. These are three different scenarios. And it's showing the role of it's US power generation. It's showing the role of natural gas, because natural gas is our lar largest single source of electricity, which is a new phenomenon. The role of natural gas in the electric power sector has grown a lot, largely displacing coal and enabling renewables, because we produce natural gas electricity when the wind is not blowing and the sun's not shining. And it shows these different scenarios where if we really achieve our commitments to decarbonize, the role of natural gas is going to decrease. If we don't have the policy and the economic support to really reach for those goals, then the role of natural gas is going to continue, albeit at a lower level, that fundamentally wind and solar are going to be the largest. I have some more slides that show this that aren't as pretty as these, that that's wind and solar and storage are the fastest growing sectors in terms of US electrification. We use natural gas for high temperature heat for making everything from soup. Like if you go to Campbell's Soup, they're burning natural gas to, to cook vast quantities of tomatoes to make tomato soup. If you go to a steel factory, if you go to NICOR or a place like that, they are making steel with very high temperature heat. And currently, they're doing that with natural gas. There are announcements being made that they, you know, if we can have a nuclear renaissance, they're going to move to nuclear-fired electric heat to do that in the future. So a lot of industrial heat applications. I made a list off the top of my head when I thought of pros of natural gas today, which was not the case 20 years ago. Natural gas is abundant. It's versatile. We use it for more things than we do most energy resources. We use it for power. We use it for heating and cooling. We use it for industrial heat. It's very dispatchable. You can turn on. It's not as dispatchable as a battery, which is milliseconds to dispatch, but it's minutes compared to hours for a coal or nuclear power plant. It's relatively clean burning. It doesn't have the socks and knocks that coal does, for instance. Um, and it's pretty sad when coal is our basis of comparison, but it is the basis of comparison. And there's a lot of coal in the, energy, in the, in the electric power mix right now. There's no solid waste with natural gas. And so because of all those things, it gets called the prince of hydrocarbons, but it's still a hydrocarbon. And it still is a very potent greenhouse gas. So, and on the con side, but other than it being a potent greenhouse gas, which is number one, two, and three, uh, its distribution, like most energy resources that are stock resources, its distribution's uneven. So there are geopolitical issues, notably, most recently, Russia and the Ukraine, uh, but that's, that's actually an old tension that got very activated by a war. Um, and I think for natural gas, one of the reasons it was the booby prize for so long is its low energy density. So the ability to move it around has been complex. And fundamentally, as we learned on Monday, it's depletable, just like oil and coal are. It takes millions of years to make it, and we burn it very quickly. And we're going to talk about uh, how significant is it. I think you know one of the things for me who I don't have birthdays anymore. I'm staying the same age. I'm teasing. But um, in the lower right, Natural gas wasn't 40% 20 years ago. It was less than half that. And so this shale gas revolution and the recognition and the Clean Air Act basically favored gas relative to coal. And then wind and solar became more economic and more supported from a subsidy point of view than they had been with a little more continuity. But they fundamentally became more economic because the wind and the sun are, sorry, the technology to harness the wind and the sun are technologies. And as you scale them, the cost of those technologies go down. And so the more wind and solar we had, the more we've needed gas to help balance the system. I will be surprised personally if the role of gas grows much above where it is now. And I think it's going to peak and it's going to drop down. And as you'll see in other data that we're, I'm going to share with you, that the build out of wind, solar, and storage is just going to continue, and it will shave away at the role of natural gas over time. 
So part of what's ironic for people like me is they say, oh, we're in, this is the energy transition. Well, we've been transitioning pretty steadily from whale oil and wood and things like that. And I'm trying to frame it in the, in the context that 20 years ago, we, the role of natural gas was less than half of what it is today. So the speed of transition, we all would like it to go faster, but it's actually really hard to build out all the infrastructure and drive the markets that cause this transition <laughs> to take place. So you see the role of natural gas, it's you know, three, two, two, one. You know, it's really important both in the world energy system and in the world and US electric power system. So big role displacing coal for all the reasons we just talked about. We have seen the role of natural gas draw, d grow significantly, and we've talked about several of those factors, but there's a nice list of them here, rather than me reading all of them to you, many of which we covered as we talked about both what's happened in the last 20 years and what the positive attributes of natural gas are. I'd say 20, 30 years ago, we didn't value the cleanliness and flexibility of natural gas the way we do now, and that became enough to reframe the regulatory environment to build out you know, within the United States, 99% of all the gas moves by pipeline. We had to build out that pipeline infrastructure. There's still more to build probably to equitably deliver gas. So people who live in New York State, in Connecticut, a lot of parts of New England, there's actually very little, if any, access to natural gas. The pipeline infrastructure is not there. And an interesting part of that for residential heating and cooling Part of what's happened with our awareness of climate change, with the Ukraine, the war in Russia and the Ukraine, is there's a huge renaissance going on now for heat pumps, which are an electric substitute for gas-fired heating and coolings of residences and commercial buildings. And so what's going to happen is a lot of parts of our country that didn't have access to the natural gas infrastructure to deliver gas to homes and businesses, they're going to leap from gas to the electrification that heat pumps provide. So this is just electricity, and it's showing the role of natural gas in the world, in the United States, in California, so all in orange, and the role for electricity on campus. That's just for electricity. We are still using natural gas for heating and cooling on campus. Not as much as we would if we didn't have the SESI facility on campus, and you'll be learning more about the energy systems on campus in the course of the class. But this is just the electric use of natural gas in the world, in, California, in the US, in California to frame it. California has a stated goal to get to net zero in the electric power sector, and more broadly, but certainly in the electric power sector by 2045. And so it shows there's a lot of natural gas that has to come out of the system that's there now for California to achieve its goals. So a lot of this information, you know, is, is uh, and just to refresh, I think this has been discussed already in class, but not by me, is the, the role of electricity and Stanford and all that yellow and all that solar, very little of that is on campus. Those are power purchase agreements signed with very large solar facilities that are, you know, a few hours from campus actually, but it's the university contracting for solar electricity to meet the university's needs. This is contextualizing where does California sit if you read the second bullet. It's saying that uh, you know, California ranks second in the United States as a gas consumer. Texas is number one by a long, long margin, you know, more than twice as much as California. Texas is a very populous state. It has a lot of industrial activity that gas gets used for. So there's kind of a lot of facts on this slide that are different dimensions of things. It's reminding you where our utility territories are. PG&E covers most of Northern, Northern California, and you see the other utilities below. And basically, sometimes we zoom. So in this slide, we're simultaneously zooming out to California and giving you information about the role of California. And then we're zooming in and saying, well, if you were a typical resident in PG&E's territory, how much would you pay every month in your natural gas bill? largely for cooking and heating and cooling your home. So it's ju just giving you a sense of that, and it's such a small part of most people's utility bill, they've got other things to worry about than rather, you know, and, and so that's a whole dialogue about what's the role of the utilities, and if the state's gonna meet a net zero goal, is it the customer's job to get rid of that methane use, or should the utility come in and retrofit the house for them and put in a heat pump and remove that gas? So I'm just trying to frame, when we think about natural gas in a residence in California, what does that look like? And obviously in California, 
the gas bill in California is going to be different than it is in Wisconsin or Michigan in the winter because our weather volatility in most of the state is in a narrower range than it is in places that require more heating and cooling. Another interesting thing and why the, the renaissance and the interest in heat pumps, because they can deliver heating and cooling, we have a warming planet, which I think most of you have figured out, and so the demand for air conditioning is something that a lot of people are saying, whoo, that's going to skyrocket, and how are we going to deliver that energy service of air conditioning? Are we going to do it with gas, or are we going to do it with electricity, and hopefully with renewable electricity? So we have to keep testing ourselves to look at parts of the energy system and then contextualize it more broadly in the system, which is part of what the, the stretching and thinking about these ideas is all about in this class, honestly. So this slide is meant to remind us that all resources are not the same. Certainly we have resources that are you know, chemical in nature, the fossil fuels. We have other resources that are really around harnessing radiative energy like the sun or the kinetic energy of the wind. There's those kinds of differences and are they stock or are they flow resources? But then what's the product market fit really for resources and delivery of energy services? So when you think of coal, nuclear, wind and solar, you should think of electricity. We're not using those to deliver heat directly. That we start with generating electricity from those. In the case of oil, the largest single service that oil is providing currently is transportation fuels. The other things are a whole basket that Diana will talk more about when she talks about refining of waxes and asphalts and petrochemicals and things like that. But the largest single thing is transportation fuels there in purple. Natural gas is unusual as an energy resource in that we use it for heating and cooling directly. For industrial process heat, we use it as an industrial feedstock for fertilizer and all kinds of other things. And we use it for power generation. And the little uh, purple part at the top is we actually, a lot of people, it's not like Peru. In the United States, we barely use anything for vehicles and natural gas, even though there was a famous gentleman, Ross Perot, who really tried to use compressed natural gas in vehicles. The, the transportation part you see there is about 3% of all natural gas produced and used in the United States goes to run the compressors that transport the gas around the country. So it's the embodied energy required to keep the pressure in the system to move the gas around. So this slide is meant to just help you gently remind you that all energy resources are not the same in terms of how we think about using them. So this is kind of pivoting the way we're thinking about natural gas and we're thinking about, so if you go back to this and you go to the bar on the left, and you see those different uses, let's look at that kind of a different way and say, so there you see the pipeline use of natural gas for transportation. The vehicle part is this teeny sliver. And I apologize for people from Peru and other parts of the world that, again, this is a very US-centric view. Um, you see electricity generation, that's straightforward. And CHP is combined heat and power, so opportunities where we can take the waste heat from power generation and make more power from it, a combined cycle, for instance, um, or do something else with the heat. There's the industrial. When we say industrial uses, it's showing process heat, boilers, electricity, on-site at a factory, something like that, and the different uses. You see the commercial application, the residential application of space heating those are things that the heat pump world or other systems for delivering heating and cooling that don't involve combustion of natural gas, there's a big renaissance of that going on in, around this and also thinking more carefully about how to insulate buildings so that you need less heating and cooling in the first place. So hopefully this gives you a sense of how gas is used in different sectors because that's the goal of the slide and only in the US. So I get to pull my story of you know long ago and far away in a distant land, like right around 1982 was when I took this class. I took it in 80, and I was still TAing it in 1982. And you see where gas and coal were. They were neck and neck in terms of their role in the energy system. And you see the divergence over time that I was referring to of you know, how coal played a much more important role previously than it does today. And the Clean Air Act has played a big role in that because of all the particulate matter. A really big thing that has harmed coal is as renewables have entered the grid, they're very uh, unpredictable. And gas can be dispatched to match that unpredictability. Coal plants and nuclear plants like to be turned on and off very, very slowly. So they don't fit with renewables very well. 
And renewables are not only better for the environment, they're really cheap. The marginal cost, the cost on the margin of harnessing the sun or harnessing the wind, once you've had the capital costs and you start depreciating that, everybody, regardless of the environmental attributes, they want to prioritize on the grid the lowest cost of electricity, and renewables will pretty much always win that game. And so having gas to back that up has been a powerful part of the story. So um, look how small wind and solar are. So this is looking at energy, not electricity. So that's part of the reason they look smaller than their role would look if we looked at electric power. And you see how not much has happened in the nuclear space in a long time. Diana's already talked about it, and she'll talk to you about it some more, even though nuclear is its own topic. So this is how do you create the history of something like your family, or your state, or your town, or an industry in one slide. So this is kind of the what you really need to know about the history of natural gas in four chapters, summarized at the bottom, and then regulatory history and technology advances in the two columns here. We don't need you to memorize every single aspect of this. It's more to frame the evolution of the industry and that you know, I jumped into the world kind of in the, in the middle here where just as the world was starting to move, when I came to grad school, it was still very conventional. And then I got to come back to Stanford just as we were pivoting into being unconventional. And so we've had these technology changes. We've moved from vertical wells. We've had really fundamental changes where the economists, which hopefully there's some of you in the room, really came up with some much better regulatory frameworks that incentivized the development of natural gas in our country in ways that previously had been very restic restrictive and really emphasized the booby prize aspect of finding natural gas. So, you know, the aerospace industry and the people who make airplanes like Boeing and GE and people like that, or at least the, the engines for airplanes, there, were, there was a renaissance of turbines, gas turbines, combustion turbines, and the idea of could we have a combined cycle, which you'll learn about in our electric power lectures, where we actually com we combust natural gas, we make electricity from the exhaust of combusting natural gas by spinning a turbine attached to a generator, but that exhaust heat was so hot, we realized we could take that exhaust heat and make electricity a second time. And so that's the combined cycle gas turbine, really big jump in efficiency of converting natural gas to electricity, and then once we gained those efficiency opportunities, the focus of the last 10 or 15 years has been on the dispatchability from it was a big deal 10 years ago, oh, we can dispatch in an hour. Now it's down to like five minutes of dispatching. So they've really worked on making combined cycle natural gas power plants something very integrative into the grid. I, I will kind of end this slide by saying it should say next trend methane rules, and that's really methane leakage rules. Um, and, and so this, the renaissance now the big technological development is we have the capacity to collect data and see methane in ways we couldn't before. And Rob Jackson and Adam Brandt here at Stanford and the Natural Gas Initiative are leaders in the country on this work. So if any of you have an interest in methane management, there's a lot to do at Stanford, which I'm really proud of the work that they're doing here, and it's really, really important, is until we can get through this transition that we would like to accelerate, and we want to use all the benefits of natural gas. We don't want those benefits to be negated by the leakage in the system. And we can't manage the leakage until we can see it, monitor, measure it, and cr create credibility in the system that some gas systems are differentiated from others in terms of how well they're being managed. And people should be able to command a price in the market or be rewarded with a tax incentive for managing their methane emissions. I, I will say this in a rather blunt way. It is completely legal to dump methane into the atmosphere today and until around the world. So until we put a price or a penalty on methane leakage, you know, you can't really drive the tools and the markets necessary to cause people to be truly incentivized not to leak. So the first step is you have to have the tools to frame the problem, and those tools have really just arrived in the last five years. Environmental Defense and other organizations, private and nonprofit and government, are launching dedicated satellites for methane management that have only, they're either going up in the next year or two, or they've gone up in the last two years. So this is the next column or the next uh, hexagon down there is methane management until we can get to a place we're not dependent on it to manage our tr transition to net zero. So I was kind of excited to see this actually. It just came out because I had a bunch of slides from spring that were basically saying 
natural gas is going to take off. It's just going to keep growing the way it's been growing, stay at 40% in the US for electric generation, et cetera. And you know, th I'm really glad I don't work for the Energy Information Administration because a lot of people there are in the business of making forecasts. And usually, the minute you make a forecast, it's wrong. And so you know, it's, it's hard to do what they do. But they're basically forecasting a pretty significant reduction in the role of natural gas as wind, solar, nuclear's sitting tight, coal's declining, and then we don't have the one that goes with it that supports. Batteries are not a resource, but they are a stabilization tool for renewables on the grid, and they are getting built out. And they're also a technology, like solar panels and wind turbines are. And technologies tend to get optimized uh, over time to deliver services at lower costs. So uh, this is just an interesting view of the future. If you go to the EIA website on the same topic, you can usually find four or five forecasts on the same thing that usually don't agree. So this is not the only one there. But I was like, I'm just going to share this to say there's certain people at the EIA who are basically arguing renewable technologies are going to dominate the future. This is the, the comments on this slide are more annual in nature. The slide itself is showing monthly data to show you some of the data that the EIA collects on what are the additions of generating capacity we have in the United States on the top, and on the bottom, what are we retiring? You can see we're dominantly retiring coal plants. And secondarily, we're retiring natural gas plants that largely during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we built gas plants that did one thing. Their single purpose was to be peaking plants. So they did not provide baseload electricity. They were like emergency backup systems. We don't need those anymore. And they're very inefficient, and they're very old. So there's a lot of decommissioning of those going on. There's very little decommissioning of the natural gas power plants that were built in the last 10 or 15 years. You are going to get an opportunity to go to a relatively modern, it's less than 20 years old, I think, plant called Lodi. And you're all like, well, just give us the sign-up sheet and tell us more about it. So we're going to get that to you soon. But part of the narrative of Lodi is it's a combined cycle gas power plant that we brought students to when it first opened. And it's actually now being, its role in the grid is much less than it was originally thought to be because of renewables. And they're in the process of, of uh, applying to the Department of Energy for it to become a hydrogen hub and to repurpose the site instead of with an emphasis on gas to hydrogen. This is another way to look at what's coming up. So these are what happens is there's a long permit process to decommission power plants. There are All that information gets collected. The EIA is keeping track of it. This data shifts over time. But this is the latest and greatest from August about if you look during the next 27 years, what are we going to see being decommissioned over a longer period of time, not just the months I just showed you. And so this is to give you a sense that we got a lot of coal that's very rigid on the grid, that's very dirty and creates a lot of air pollution. And it has solid waste in the form of ash. And it's getting decommissioned. And largely, our older gas plants are being moved out while we're still building some new ones. We're not building a lot of new coal in the US. We're building a lot of new coal, sadly, in China and other parts of the world. So this is meant to give you a sense of the momentum of growth in the different markets for natural gas. So we kind of switched now to the markets that if you look at the last 10 years, power's gone up, industrial use has gone up, Exports have gone up a lot. Pipeline exports have gone up relatively uh, significantly. And commercial, residential, and transportation uses have gone up. Like I said, I don't expect to see this upness continue, but I expect it to maintain for quite some time. This is to give you a snapshot about, we say oil and gas sometimes like they're one word. And the markets for oil and gas, you remember, are really different. We're using uh, natural gas for power and for heating and cooling. And we're using oil for transportation fuels. So this is meant to show what happened with COVID is we stopped driving compared to normal. So oil was really impacted by COVID. And we still needed natural gas for power and for heating and cooling. So natural gas was not nearly as impacted by COVID as oil was. That's really the only point I want to make is that on things like that, you should separate how you think about them. You should think about them similarly in terms of how we get stuff out of the ground. But just wanted to make that point. There's a beautiful, simple, idealized molecule. What is natural gas? We've seen this before. Its nickname is the prince of hydrocarbons. It is also a hydrocarbon. And we know everything already, because we've talked about fossil fuels on Monday, what that entails. So it's just the reminder, what is natural gas? And as someone called out, it's the, 
It's the cleanest of the fossil fuels. It's the most flexible of the fossil fuels. And it's a lot more abundant than it used to be. It is no longer the booby prize. So when we talk about natural gas, you know that an energy class is full of jargon. So this is, I mean that respectfully. And so there's kind of three broad differentiations we make about natural gas when we talk about it. Is it sweet, is it sour, is it associated or not? And when it's not associated, that means it's pretty darn dry gas. And is it wet or dry? So does it have a lot of natural gas liquids in it? So you can have oil, excuse me, gas that's associated with oil, and that, that's its, where is it found? And then you can have gas that's wet, where you produce it, and it's really hard, it's, when you try and produce the gas, a lot of natural gas liquids come with it and need to be separated. And I think I made the point that we, I showed a slide on Wednesday that showed when we produce oil and gas and water out of the ground, we have local processing near the wellheads. And in the case of natural gas, we may need to process the natural gas to remove natural gas liquids or remove the sulfur. But after that, it goes into the pipeline. It gets boosted into the pipeline in terms of compressed. It meets certain standards. We'll talk about it in a moment. Whereas with oil, we have to go to a refinery, and we have to do a lot more. So oil represents more complexity in terms of what we have to do with it. So where is the natural gas? So on this slide, what it's showing you is two things. Where are the proved reserves, which is in yellow. It shows you that Russia, Iran, and Qatar have enormous reserves of natural gas. We are not running out. We have enough to last us longer than would be good. Um, and we've talked about the fact that the US is the largest producer and largest consumer. So it's reflected there in the blue bar. And Russia is next in line in terms of its role as a significant producer. So this is about reserve to production ratio. Remember something I introduced on Monday and just showing you what it is for natural gas in the blue dotted line. It's dropped a little bit because reserves have actually not kept up with how production's growing. And some of that has to do, do you remember the hyperbolic decline? That as we bring in, if we're drilling horizontally, and we bring new wells online, we get very big production in the beginning, and then it goes on decline. The main point of this slide that I want you to take away from this is we are not running out of natural gas. And actually, we keep finding more and more. And Qatar, in particular, is super well endowed with natural gas. It has huge reserves. And we really haven't applied horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing very much outside the United States. So we haven't really gone unconventional many other places. So there is a lot of gas out there that we haven't even found yet if we wanted to find it. So um, there's not a scarcity issue, which was when I took this class 40 years ago. Um, scarcity was the main message. We're running out of everything was the mentality. And now technology has really caused a renaissance in terms of our being able to find things and understand things in the subsurface we did not have before. The same point, the US is the largest consumer. Who else are the big consumers? EU is a big consumer, and we are now providing gas to them to make up for some of the gas they used to get from Russia. But these are the big consumers of gas. Uh, there's really four regions that make up you know, more than half there. You see China, Russia, the EU, and the US. And you saw this before. You know, Technology in the United States has fueled our capacity to export gas and to be the largest consumer. And you saw this before, this argument that really three areas, Appalachia, the Permian Basin of Texas and New Mexico, and the Haynesville, which is Louisiana and Texas, over on the east side of Texas, those are the three regions that account for about two-thirds of all our gas. And then on a reserves and production basis in the US, you see how you know, it's concentrated. Texas, Pennsylvania, super important, Oklahoma, Ohio, West Virginia, states like that. But Texas and Pennsylvania kind of rule in oil and gas in our country. So everybody remembers what's this called, right? What you leave, the valves you leave on the subsurface is a different visual than the one I showed you on Wednesday. But we would call this a Christmas tree an assembly of, well, of valves at a, at a wellhead. They don't always look the same. So we're going to talk about, more about the system. And it's a little bit of a dense diagram. But I always like to introduce anything, whether it's they're taking it out of the ground. That's a stock resource. There's an upstream. It could be lithium that we're extracting out of brine. There's the upstream. There's the midstream, which is, so upstream is extraction. Midstream is refining. And downstream is distribution to the customers that could be strategic customers that you're providing 
lithium to as a feedstock or you're providing oil to, to or gasoline to, to go into a, a gas station, something like that. So these are the key elements. We're going to talk a little bit more about processing. We're going to talk, you know, I've talked about transport, which is really we move, because of its low energy density, we either move it by pipeline or by LNG. We don't put very much on rail cars like we do oil. And the largest single use of the US rail system is moving coal. Most people don't know that. It's an interesting form of subsidy. So, um, and ultimately the goal is to get uh, natural gas to commercial customers, to residential customers. And I don't know what a large volume customer is, but I think that's an industrial customer is what that means. So, and storage is an interesting part of the gas we need in the United States, and I apologize to people from Peru and China and other places around the world. Again, very US centric. But if you think of 365 days a year of gas needs in the US, we store about six, 55 to 60 days worth of gas supply near where we need it. Because a lot of the gas supply is not near the market. And so storage, which it shows up here, is a really important part of the midstream is moving gas to a place where we can dispatch it when we need it. So this is going back to the, how do we get gas ready from where we produce it to move it into the pipeline system? And so those are gas processing plants. And this shows you where they are, and it matches where, in general, where there's a lot of production. Uh, so Texas, Oklahoma, remember Pennsylvania, we've got a lot of gas production. So these are facilities that are designed to clean up the gas get it to the right BTU level, remove any natural gas liquids, remove impurities, and get it into the pipeline system. I didn't know this until I started teaching this class that you know, I kind of grew up with uh, houses that had gas stoves. And you could pretty much tell when the pilot light was out because there was like that rotten egg smell. I didn't really appreciate that natural gas doesn't occur that way naturally, and that we actually add uh, mercaptan to the gas to, for safety reasons so that people can smell it in a room because if you have a gas leak in a room and someone back, at least when I was growing up, a lot of our parents smoked. So if you had a gas leak in the kitchen and someone lit up, you're in really big trouble. So from a safety point of view, uh, having that odor was a, is a clue to all of us that we might have a gas leak somewhere or a pilot light's been left on. So how do we transport it? I casually said it's either by LNG or pipeline, but in the United States, you know, it's really pipeline. And in North America overall, and it just shows kind of the different regions of interstate gas flow and capacity. This is highly regulated by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. These pipelines cross state boundaries, much the way transmission lines do. These are natural monopolies in the, land, in the language of economists how the companies who own pipelines and own transmission lines earn a return has to be managed thoughtfully and the right of ways for these need to be built and developed in ways, hopefully, you know, inevitably there's displacement of people and it becomes, it becomes tricky. But um, I just wanted to give you a sense of what the pipeline system looked like. If we don't have pipelines, you know, one of the things that's interesting is we can do all these things shown here, which is we can shut it down. And part of the reason I showed the flaring and the role of Crusoe going out and saying, oh, there's gas that they're just flaring because they don't know what to do with it. We'll send out our little Bitcoin mining equipment out there and take advantage of that free fuel that is there. Is these are the solutions that we talked about earlier in the lower right of what do we do if we don't have a pipeline. And pipelines are really expensive, big upfront cost, and then the marginal cost of moving gas in pipelines is lower. Uh, Kinder Morgan is a big mid, so pipeline companies are often referred to as midstream companies. If you're an investment person, owners of pipelines tend often are, are infrastructure companies. So infrastructure companies also build and own transmission equipment. Then they tend to focus on the midstream of the energy system. It's very high front end capital intensive and low marginal cost of operating after that. So I talked about the fact that 3% of all natural gas consumption in the US goes to moving the gas around. And this shows you where all the compressors are that are maintaining the pressure in the pipeline system to allow our circulatory system for gas to work in our country. There is an evolution, 6%, and I bet it's risen to closer to 10 at least by now. It has not been mandated. But there's a movement to move those compressors to be electric rather than gas. Again, a point of juncture to manage emissions and leakage risk. And so we'll see how that goes over time. Um, 
So managing pressure across this whole system is an important part of the success of the system. The majority, I think it's like 80% of our whole natural gas distribution system is underground. That helps manage leakage as well. But again, in this renaissance of our ability to collect data being uh, cheaper and higher fidelity than it's ever been before, getting sensors across our whole pipeline system, underground or not, is a really important part of managing the potential leakage that could take place. So LNG, you guys had a video or two on LNG to help explain what it is and this uh, one one six hundredth of the volume. So this is pretty significant compression. It's very high temperatures. It is, there's embodied energy required to get it in this mode. This is showing a floating LNG facility. I'm pretty sure it's, if I remember, it's off the coast of Australia. Yeah, to help manage how far we need to go to do all of this. But it's a, it's a complex set of infrastructure itself with leakage potential in that system as well. So LNG has become much more mainstream than it was 20, 30 years ago. And I think people really believe it will continue to build out. And we have some slides on that in a moment. The US, the price of natural gas, excuse me, of LNG is um, uh, in kind of pinky purple at the bottom. And it shows you, and that's our price is low because we have so much ourselves. The rest of the world's willing to pay a lot for natural gas. And a lot of their objective in importing natural gas is to reduce dependence on coal. So until, and many countries are limited so far in terms of their ability to really build out wind and solar at large scale because they don't have as much land as we do. So they have their own version of banana and NIMBY issues. So for the most part, and, and probably 10 to 15 years ago, now there's a more structured market for LNG where it flows like a, a trading system. For a long time, early in the LNG markets, people were literally signing independent contracts for each tanker of LNG. It was much more like pieces of Lego than a state of flow of a marketplace that we have more of today. This gives you a sense of the biggest LNG traders and, and pipeline traders and a sense globally uh, you know, that basically two-thirds of our gas is produced and consumed in the same country, and the other third is an export, import-export business. So this gives you a sense of, uh, this is Chenier's Sabine Pass uh, in the upper right. That was originally built to import natural gas, and then they retrofitted it, rebuilt it, to be able to, sorry, they were going to, we were going to import LNG, and now we export out of it. Um, this shows you in the United States how many facilities. We have eight so far. Uh, shows you how, they're, how significant they are in terms of how much of US production they export. But it shows you the amount of pr approved and constructed or not constructed capacity we have in the system. So there is a lot of uh, infrastructure capital going to these very expensive plants that are providing natural gas to many other countries. So uh, it's just to give it some context. And this is meant, we have a couple slides here to talk about the Ukraine and Russia. So what's interesting is the picture here. In 2009, before the recent war, the way when I was standing in class I would describe it is Russia had a choke chain on the U Ukraine. That if the Ukraine and other parts of Europe weren't behaving properly, Russia would cut off supply of natural gas. And those countries, Western Europe was very dependent on Russian gas being delivered by pipeline. And so now we have, then, then we have a step change in that whole dynamic. Of, and a lot of people died, actually, because there wasn't gas to meet heating needs. So it got the world's attention. It's like, ooh, Russia's really you know, playing with that choke chain. So the war is a much bigger narrative around that than the early leg, you know, legacy play with the choke chain. And so this shows the importance of, in 2021, of the role Russian gas exports were playing across Europe and we've got some things you can link to and read some more or watch some more in a CNN video if you'd like. But this is really interesting to me to see how things have changed from 2017 to 2022 in terms of the role of Russian gas in Europe in response to the war. And the US export of natural gas in this world where natural gas is not evenly distributed, right? So our export capacity is kind of playing a big role um, in Europe uh, to displace you know, the role that Russia was, was playing in Europe. So it's an interesting 
we are always in a state of energy transition from my point of view. Sometimes it has more dimensions and more speed and scale to it, but this is one aspect to it that I think a lot of people you know, have not seen. So I alluded to the fact that we have 55 to 60 days of gas in storage. You see that, I think it calls that out 50 days is what it says on the right. So here's our friend, the EIA. If you ever want to see what's going on with gas storage, you can Google the EIA, they'll tell you. So one of the things that really affects, again, I apologize, this is very US centric, what affects the spot price of gas in the United States as we go into winter is what is NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency, saying about how cold it's going to be. So if the commodities traders think, oh my god, it's going to be a cold winter, and we have not filled up storage, and we're going into winter empty or low, that causes the price of gas to go up because it makes the commodity traders believe that we're not going to be resilient to responding to cold snaps when they happen because they, we won't have enough gas in storage near where we need it. So the st gas storage is something that get natural gas commodity traders look at a lot. So th it goes to this idea, having the storage provides price stability. Most importantly, it provides resilience in terms of when we need gas, because a lot of it historically has been weather driven, you know, is there dispatchable supply nearby? So this shows you, so where do we store this gas? We do not store it in big tanks on the surface. We do a little bit of that. And when we do do that, we usually do it locally. So people in Boston, you know, there's a couple places in Boston where there actually are near the waterfront some tanks that have LNG in them that's there really meant for local storage. But on a volume point of view, most of that 50 to 56, I guess I have inconsistency between the 56 and the 50, but 80% of that is in depleted reservoirs. So we're taking a reservoir that's produced most of the oil or gas, and it's empty. It's an empty container, and we're re-injecting gas from somewhere else into it, and that reservoir is near a point of load, of use. You see that 10% is in aquifers that have been certified. They're usually depleted aquifers. And there are other cases, largely in the Gulf Coast, where there are salt formations that have poor space or pools of capacity in them that we can inject natural gas into as well. We had an issue with a natural gas storage facility in California several years ago called the Liso Canyon, where the cement job on some of the wells in that natural gas storage facility, the cement failed, and there was big methane leaks out of this natural gas storage facility. So one of the things that was good about that, you know, our way to store the gas in this, these facilities is the gas has to go up and down well bores, right? So these are not necessarily producing new gas wells, but we have to manage those well bores and monitor them and make sure there's integrity and there isn't leakage going on. So that scare, if you will, the Aliso Canyon storage facility really woke up the industry that we need monitoring we haven't had before on these storage facilities to really evaluate the integrity. So they've gone back down and all those well bores, they can essentially do MRIs of the well bores, evaluate the, 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 the casing, the steel casing, and how strong the concrete is, and manage and evaluate that integrity. So sometimes when something bad happens, a lot of good things come from it, but it was, it was scary. And a lot of, in the news, there was a lot of infrared cameras that really allowed everybody you, otherwise, you couldn't see the methane to see what a big plume was coming out of the ground. So that goes to how does natural gas impact the environment? We've talked about this a fair amount already, but we're going to talk about it some more. Um, we use a sketch like this for many of our resources. And to indicate that when you're in the upstream, like extraction and separation and pipelines, what's going on from a from an efficiency point of view, there aren't a lot of, when you get to thinking about thermodynamic laws, that, that, that process is pretty efficient. Burning natural gas is pretty efficient, certainly in a combined cycle power plant. And some of the other aspects, you know, compared, as we said before, to coal and oil, natural gas is the prince of hydrocarbons. But we have this big issue. Everybody should, like, I should kind of write it all the way across the whole slide, which is leakage. That is the big risk that negates all the benefits associated with this if we have leakage. So we've just tried to go on the upstream and list impacts there, on the midstream, list impacts, the downstream, list impacts. So a lot of the way gas always gets framed environmentally is in this transition role that is likely not a long-term role. 
because there are greenhouse gas and other uh, impacts associated with its use. But on a relative basis, compared to where we were, to coal in particular, it has been a, a transitional significant improvement. So this slide, and there's one I found right before class uh, in a relatively new article that shows this same information, a, a kind of on a pivot table different way, so you can think about it. But when you look at all global methane emissions from natural gas and you put them in context, a lot of our emissions are related to agriculture or to uh, things that are just the natural system releasing methane. So, but I'm really a big believer is we've got to manage what we can manage and what certainly people in this class can be thinking about is the role of biofuels, coal mines, and oil and gas and that combined role in terms of methane emissions. How do we manage those systems so that they don't leak methane? We have, you know, in the coal lecture, you're going to talk about the fact that we have a lot of methane leaking out of coal mines. How do we manage that? We don't have the tools to do that yet. And that's something I'm hoping folks like you all will help us with the kind of new super tools we haven't had before that we have today that we can really get a grip on those things as quickly as possible. Um, this is showing globally how methane emissions are rising and where they're coming from. Uh, I find it really cha challenging. This is from the International Energy Agency. Getting all the emissions, this is showing from coal and oil shale and gas and oil and biofuels. So it's showing from that energy sector. I want to see something too, not to minimize this, but what are the emissions from everything else? And one of our greatest challenges, because this is, I want to emphasize, this is something we can really control. But a, a meta risk is that as the ice is melting in the Arctic, there's a lot of biogenic methane that is being released. So this methane cycle and its potency in the first 10 years, that, or at the 12 years of its life, it's a really significant driver of global warming. So hopefully, I don't feel like methane management is a mainstream idea, and it's something I guess I want to just keep advocating that it's something we'd be thinking about across our whole system, agricultural, energy, and the natural world. Um, so these uh, pie charts help me think about contextualizing, and this is just U.S. This is just U.S. So how do I think about, because I don't want to minimize it at all, I want to understand how to think what's the role in a natural gas lecture of thinking about where do we, where do we get our methane emissions uh, relative to greenhouse gas emissions, which is what's shown on the left. So methane's 10% of the story. If you take the methane, that's why the next pie chart is blue, you take the methane and say, where does the methane come from in the US? And those are all the sources from manure management, coal mining, all those things. Well, 28% of all US methane emissions are coming from the natural gas system, okay? So then the green pie chart is where in the natural gas system do those emissions come from? Because we need different tools and rules for each wedge of each of those pies. And if we can understand how those things nest, we can have policy and we have, can have technology that helps address those problems. So that's our goal. So I think one of the things that a lot of people point to is if you combust natural gas relative to coal from a greenhouse gas emissions policy, po not policy, uh, point of view, if you're just looking at the combustion, what people argue is if you have more than 3% leakage in the natural gas system, it negates the benefit of the greenhouse gas emissions of coal. So we want to go after that leakage as fast and as thoroughly as we can, and then we get the co-benefit, if you will, which we'll talk about in a moment, that with natural gas we don't have the solid waste, we don't have the local air pollution to the same degree, we do have the dispatch, you know, natural gas has a lot of other benefits besides the greenhouse gas part of it, but we cannot be cavalier about managing leakage and meth, you know, methane leakage is far below 3% as we possibly can. Like I said, it's a brand new game. We finally have the tools to do it, and we don't have the rules yet. It's totally legal to leak methane, and it's a lot more potent than CO2. So hopefully from a policy point of view, we'll get the strength to really make it more prohibitive to leak methane. So this is something about the tools. You can't manage what you can't see. I've made the argument this is pretty new, that a lot of these things have come out. You saw the TED Talk on methane and EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, is really one of the NGO, non-governmental organization, nonprofit leaders in putting science and policy 
work and really driving an effort around methane. They've launched their own satellite with some partners for methane management. On the right is Rob Jackson's vehicle. I think that is, might be in Manhattan, but they basically, his research team has gone into major urban centers. A, play, a different end of the spectrum to think about leakage is in uh, Detroit or in New York City or in Chicago or San Francisco. All the local distribution pipes that are bringing gas into, into urban centers, they drive around and they get uh, displays that show those pipes are leaking. And so it, they have to collect that data, then they can take it to the utility, then the utility can say, okay, we gotta rip up the streets and we're gonna replace it with better pipe or we're gonna minimize how much gas we have and we're gonna go electric and use heat pumps and things like that. So you can't get regulators, unfortunately, to respond until you can present data to them. And so that is a role for academia to play is to do this kind of research, which again, I'll make a play for the Natural Gas Initiative. That's the kind of thing some of you could get involved in if you would like to. I mentioned Project Canary. It's in the business, it's a B Corp. It's a little bit like an auditor. So if Exxon says we're not leaking any gas, then it's Project Canary's role to come in and certify that that's true. So there's an acronym that's evolved out of that called responsibly sourced gas, not to be confused with renewable natural gas, which, you know, some of these things, so renewable natural gas, is natural gas that's produced largely from landfills. And we don't want natural gas, which is biogenic in origin, to leak out of landfills. And so there are incentives for renewable natural gas to collect that gas out of landfills and use it for commercial purposes. So various separate policies, if you will. There's more policy to support renewable natural gas. In a world where leaking natural gas is still completely legal, uh, responsibly sourced gas is more of a market driven phenomena right now rather than a regulatory driven phenomena. Part of the RSG story, interesting going back to the Ukraine, is as the Ukraine chose from a policy, and Europe chose and said, okay, we're going to try and minimize our exposure to Russia. We're going to import LNG from the US, but we're going to demand the tankers are responsibly sourced gas. So ironically, Europe has driven responsibly sourced gas more than any federal policy or state policy. And hopefully our local policy will catch up. Because there's really no reason, gas has a lot of benefits, but we should not be leaking it into the atmosphere. This is giving you a sense of what's going on globally, different colors for different parts of the world. The United States is on top there, not because we should be on top necessarily, but that's just where we happen to be on this stack. So we're the dark orange. So when you think of, this is just flaring. This is around the world, we're producing oil or gas, and we're not capturing it for economic benefit. We're burning it so that CO2 is going in the atmosphere instead of methane. And then a point I want to drive home is the efficacy of flares tends to be pretty low, often less than 50%. And so anything we're not combusting out of a flare is still leaking into the atmosphere. And the goal is it shows there in 2030, if we're going to meet goals that we want to meet, we have a lot of flare uh, Flaring to reduce to zero, and again, the, the efficacy of those flares is still low. So to me, sharing this slide is meant to frame a problem that's a very specific one that we need to change and address. This is showing flaring in the US, largely going on in the Permian in the Williston Basin. The Williston Basin is largely in North Dakota, where we have this tight oil, and there's associated gas where we don't have a market for it, so they've been flaring it. And the good news is that flaring's reducing the where we need to go is for it to go way down and for someone to certify that those flares are 100% efficient, which currently they are not. So one of the things people point out, which I was alluding to before, is compared to coal and oil, burning it and using it in terms of extraction, processing, and combustion uses less water, less particulates, less sulfur, less NOx. So I sound like I'm a natural gas saleswoman. That's not what I want to be. I'm just trying to explain the difference in the different attributes. This is showing, this is recent from the EIA, saying reliance on natural gas is diminishing. We're seeing states and municipalities ban in any new construction natural gas appliances in homes. And just at the very top for framing things, 61% of all households have natural gas to their homes. So to me, that was an interesting factoid to contextualize things. So the economics of gas, there's Lodi, where some of you are going to get to go. That's combined cycle gas that's going to migrate towards hydrogen if the people planning and working with the plant get their way. So there's a lot of information on this slide, which I apologize for. Um, 
In the lower left, it's showing, again, all US information. Henry Hub is a location where gas trades. And so just like West Texas Intermediate is a location where oil trades, and so that's a place where prices are set. Different locations vary a little bit. They used to vary a lot more, but now there's less variation in the system. So it gives you a sense, 2022, Henry Hub was up at six bucks. Right now, Henry Hub's more like three bucks. So prices go up and down based on supply and demand, weather, which is part of demand. So the weekly Henry Hub, you see the volatility of it. These were the average annual prices, and that's in terms of the heating value of that gas, MMBTU. And then at the top, in the upper right, it's just showing supply and demand factors that impact the price of natural gas. So just trying to help you think about, well, what drives this market? And this is like a spaghetti diagram, but it's meant to show you that natural gas liquids are more valuable than just natural gas itself because those more complex hydrocarbons are getting used for higher value products, if you will, than gasoline or jet fuel. They're going into plastics and petrochemicals and things like that. This is also from the EIA. So this is just showing largely on the uh, right-hand side that a residential customer pays more per MMBTU than an industrial customer, which is basically the bigger the customer you are, the more economy of scale you have, the cheaper price you can get for your gas. The residential customer is like the last mile customer, and more and more pipeline infrastructure has to go to you, and so it makes reaching you more expensive. The price of this is all regulated by state energy commissions to play a role in this because they are granting the natural monopolies to the utilities to build out the infrastructure to do this. So it's a managed price situation. Where are we going? So that's pretty different scenarios there. New momentum, kind of business as usual, whoosh, let's keep going, versus net zero, versus uh, an accelerated ramp towards net zero. So a lot of range in terms of where we think we're going. I personally believe the energy transition is happening faster than many people think, and that we're probably more at least on the yellow path, certainly, than the green. And these are other you know, forecasts about the role of different countries under different scenarios of accelerated net zero and momentum. So this is going to be a combination of markets, and it's going to be a combination of policy. And I think a really interesting fact that I've learned recently is 91% of the global economy has set a net zero goal. States, governments, companies. Most of them have no idea how to meet it. How we're going to do all this, I don't know for sure, but I'm actually pretty optimistic that, well, first of all, we're going to be late doing it, but we're going to do it in this time frame. And I think these, the curves you see there are going to be certainly, you know, more optimistic than the, the up and to the right green scenario. And this is from McKinsey relatively recently showing that they've declared that peak gas demand globally is going to be in 2037. I actually think it might happen faster than that is my instinct, but we'll see. Um, again, a lot of the demand for gas is being driven by getting rid of coal. So it's an ironic nesting process, this role as a transition fuel. Uh, there's a radical renaissance of heat pumps going on right now. And so it's going to be very, it's kind of like when people first got personal computers. It's like, woof. And I think we're going to see heat pumps as the norm. And we're right in the beginning of it. And it's been driven by the Russian war, honestly, more than anything else. And the fear that people forecasting what temperatures are going to be about what our air conditioning load is going to be as well. So there's different camps. You see environmental defense is more, that these are two NGOs. I would say our esteemed colleague Mark Jacobson and the Sierra Club would probably be over on the right-hand side saying, don't build one more ounce of natural gas infrastructure. Stop, 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 completely. Hardcore red light. I think EDF, NRDC, World Watch, folks like that are in this, let's manage the heck out of those, that leakage and let's keep the natural gas in the system because until we have a total abundance of pump storage and uh, batteries and other ways to support renewables on the grid, we need gas to keep the renewable revolution going. So that's just to frame that there are different points of view. And one slide, as I wrap things up here, pointing out there is no commercial use of methane hydrates right now, but there is a lot of natural gas trapped largely in ice that is referred to as methane hydrates. And they're getting, in some cases, released and exposed as ice is melting. But in Japan, in particular, and a couple other parts of the world, there are actually R&D efforts underway to try and figure out how to harness this resource commercially. 
And just to wrap up, a couple of key points here. We have plenty of gas. It's versatile. It's been growing significantly in use in the electric power sector. Low energy density and its greenhouse warming potential are its two biggest problems. But relative to coal and oil, it is the cleanest of the fossil fuels. With that, I want to wish you all a fabulous weekend.